Dragon Age Inquisition was rated M for Mature by the ESRB and contains blood, intense violence, nudity, sexual content, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone! My name is Emma Ronith and I play games for the internet and today we're playing Dragon Age Inquisition. It's been a hundred episodes! But it's also time for another Codex reading. And uh, let's get right into it. We will begin with characters. Scout Harding. Forward camp has been established in the Ferelden hinterlands and suitable locations for other outposts have been identified. Progress into the area proceeded ahead of projected schedules thanks to a local volunteer. For further details, read on. Sleater was ambushed and overwhelmed by bandits, and might have died if not for the timely intervention of Lace Harding, who rescued Sleater with two well-aimed stones from a sling. Her family, Mabari, ran off the remaining three bandits. Harding and Contessa, the Mabari, escorted Sleater back to the forward camp, followed at a distance by the small herd of ambling sheep that belonged to a neighbor of the Harding family. Once there, she requested a map, which she proceeded to fill out with helpful details, most notably known bandit hideouts and ambush points. Map completed, Lace Harding took her sheep and returned home. We did not expect her to return the next morning, now outfitted with a small bow and leather jerkin, and an absent one hound and a herd of sheep. Maps are all right, but nothing beats a guide, she said. That was a week ago. She's still here. I took the liberty of offering her a position as a scout. Yours, Charter. Also, oh, that's how she joined. That's real cute. Storvacher. She is the hold beast of Stone Bear Hold. All other bears in the area are mere imitations. Storvacher. How do I even begin to explain Storvacher? Storvacher is flawless. She has two ancient elven trees for claw sharpening and a silver honey dish. I hear that her claws are valued in Denerum at 10,000 sovereigns. I hear that she sells her shed fur to Orlesian master weavers in Val Royo. Her favorite story is hard in Hightown. One time, she met Alistair Theron, fabled warrior of the Fifth Blight, and he told her she was pretty. One time, she clawed me in the face. It was amazing. From Ruminations Upon the Avar and Their Customs by Reginald de Gorge. Thane Svara Sunhair. This appears to be an unfinished letter. The handwriting is simple, and the text has many phrases crossed out. Lowlanders, if you be brave enough to... Orlesians, if you be brave enough... Merchants of Orlay, if... To those who wish to trade with Stone Bear Hold, you should know me. I am Thane Svara Sunhair. I am Thane Svara Jane's daughter, known as Sunhair. Though my blade has tasted battle tears many... Though my blade has tasted blood many, though I have fought many battles, I wish no conflict between us, but instead trade between our hold and yours. We have furs and leathers that put your lowland hides to shame, plus weapons that have tasted Hakon's winter. We have furs and leathers that will make your warriors look strong and your lovers look supple, plus weapons... We have excellent furs and leathers and weapons like none seen in the lowlands. Trade honestly and well, and there will be coin for all. Cheat us, and your blood will... Trade honestly and well, and there will be coin for all. Thane Svara Sunhair. This is a fool's task. What lowlander would come this far for furs they have not seen? Ah, Korth, I just wrote that instead of saying it. This stupid lowland writing vexes the mind. The rest of the letter is a series of angry sketches of axes. Creatures Bogfisher I accompanied Marquis de Arcambon upon this expedition reluctantly, although Arcambon insisted that an exploration to show me the truth and beauty of the world might assuage the consternation with which I observed it. As we entered the caves, the cold and brackish water dripping incessantly, we came upon a hulking beast whose great flapping paws slapped the stone. In countenance it was broad, its flaps of hide hanging loose across its bristled back. D'Arcambon drove it away, laughing at its clumsiness. 
Heedless of the declinate fangs protruding at unknowable angles from its distended maw, he said the beast, or bogfisher, as the locals called it, was a failing vestige in the land of men, fit to be tamed or slain. That night we camped beside an underground lake, its rippling waves a susurrus of inhuman whispers. The sepulchral? The fuck are these people using this goddamn kind of language? Sepulchral? Sepulchral. Sepulchral. Relating to tomb or internment. Also gloomy or dismal. That night, we camped beside an underground lake, its rippling waves a susurrus of inhuman whispers. The sepulchral emptiness of the starless night was vast, our own fire pitiful in its sullen rebellion against the unending dark. The bog fisher slipped from the lake, its flapping paws perfectly equipped to propel it through the water. Its spiny maw closed upon de Arcombon. Then the Marquis was gone, his frantic thrashing all we could see in the frenzied white water as the bog fisher pulled him under. That night I knew that this was not the land of men. The lightless, torpid waters are not tamed. Men are but ants crawling witlessly across a lily pad in a pond. Most think the emerald land bound to their tiny will. Those few who peer over the edge and see the leviathans, pale-bellied scales shimmering in colors with no name, swimming beneath them, can only scurry away, trying in vain to articulate the vast and uncaring terror that awaits. What my eyes have seen, my limited mind may never comprehend, but I shall never draw near dark water again. The bogfisher has taught me well. From An Anatomy of Various Terrible Beasts by Baron Havard, Pierre de Mortesan. The bogfisher likes hiding in dark places in water. Master does not like baths. Footnote in the margin of the manuscript by the Baron Scribe Dunwich. Is that why he was going after the Nox Morsha or whatever it was? Morta? Fucking. History. At what cost? From an aged journal found in Frostback Basin. It still tastes strange. No matter. Several water-stained pages follow before the text resumes. Have we traveled through lands more remote than these? We must have. Yet I've never felt so removed from life back home as I do now. T makes the same arguments as always, though adds lack of demons as a point in her favor. Lack is an absence, which I was quick to point out. She called me pithy. There are demons here, though not as many as we faced in those early years together. The Avar have their mages, too. The last were ill-prepared for me. I wonder if that's the part that bothers her. Oh, as always, was no help at all. We push on. My head aches. The others are singing the song we learned at that lakeside town. I forget the name of the place. I think my eyes are about to explode. Of course, A has noticed and tells the others he needs to read something. It's quiet now. The journey here took longer than expected. I must take stock of the rations. After sleep. There were more than expected. Everything has been more than expected. A few moments later and O would not be standing here. I was able to subdue the mage before things became worse. T said nothing about it afterwards. She knows O would have died. At what cost? T asked me that once. I said it costs nothing, but I don't know. I met a man who'd fought longer than I, but his mind had faded with age, and he could not answer. The point remains that I can do more. I can be more effective. We've all seen the demons, what they did. We've seen what some would do with blood. The better question is, who pays the costs, if no one takes this chance? And no one said it had to be forever just until things are settled. If you count eight times, will the number change? O asks. She's been watching me these last few days. Whatever she says, to the contrary. Damned blue bottles. I did not plan this journey as well as I should. 
I lay trying to find constellations through the leaves. T brought me some water. She just smiled, and there was no admonishment behind it. It made me feel somewhat better. As always, A cooked our dinner while deriding my own ability to produce something edible. O attempts to tell jokes. Make her they're pathetic. Why do they make me laugh anyway? Long days behind. I fear there are fewer ahead. Whatever costs I've paid, they will be worth it. It doesn't matter. This night, safe beside a fire, the three of them singing that stupid song. I'm content. Inquisitor Emeridan What is known about Inquisitor Emeridan would barely fill a page. He was a friend of Emperor Dracon. He was Inquisitor when the Seekers of Truth folded themselves into the Chantry as part of the Navarran Accord, their order serving as precursor to the Order of Templars and the Circle of Magi. Shortly after the Accord was signed, between 122 and 124 Divine, Emeridan left his position and departed, never to be seen again. These facts alone are undisputed. Everything else is uncorroborated hearsay, broad speculation, or salacious rumor-mongering. Emeridan did not willingly cede power. Dracon forced the Seekers of Truth to disband upon pain of death, then removed the Inquisitor rather than suffer rebellion in the new Chantry's ranks. Emeridan was forced to retire due to the still young Chantry's restriction requiring celibacy, as he was involved in a relationship with a mysterious Lady Mage that the Chantry erased from history. Emeridan was a rowdy noble who cared more for raucous entertainment than for the Seekers. He held the position only because Dracon wanted a loyal friend commanding the Order, and when the Seekers became part of the Chantry, Emeridan was free to retire to a life of hunting dragons and wenching. All of these stories may be true, and without more evidence we have little hope of ever reaching a clear determination. Nevertheless, I would offer a few notes that are often overlooked, as scholars delve so deeply into their own historical specialities as to lose key context. Firstly, Emperor Dracon, rightly acknowledged as the man who molded the Chantry into the organization it is today, was a pious man, committed to spreading the Chant of Light and creating a world where magic and men were governed by Andrastian principles. All sources agree that Emeridan was a close friend of Dracon, and while it is certainly possible that Emeridan was more pragmatic than pious, it is highly unlikely that Dracon would have befriended a figure who was actively opposed to the Chantry, much less tolerated such a man holding a position of power in the growing Orlesian Empire. Secondly, Inquisitor Emeridan was universally acclaimed as a powerful combatant, regardless of his supposed faith or lack thereof. Rumor mongers, suggesting Emeridan was exiled, ask us to believe that Emperor Dracon could see no use for a powerful warrior with years of command experience. Given that the Second Blight had been a fact of Orlesian life for more than fifteen years at the time of Emeridan's disappearance, with Darkspawn pouring from the Anderfells into northern Orlay in growing numbers, it is frankly absurd to suggest Dracon would casually dispose of such a military asset. Without further evidence, we may never know more about Emeridan's departure. Nevertheless, I hope that we may eschew the currently popular cynicism, at least when obvious evidence against it is presented, to see that his disappearance must have had some other cause. From Binding Emeridan by Professor Bram Kenrick, Starkhaven University Press. Letters and Notes A Letter to Harding My darling Lace, I hope this letter finds you healthy and happy. Last week I managed to barter for maps of Ferelden and Orlay from Hugen, the old soldier who rents the place on Mistress Johann's farm. You remember him, don't you? Quiet man, always smoking a pipe in his chair on the porch. He wasn't using the maps any more, so I gave him some of my jam and patched his coat in exchange for them. Now, whenever you tell me of your travels, I'll be able to track where you've been. I'm astounded, my darling, when I look at the weave of dotted trails I've already marked out on my maps. Oh, the places your feet have touched! How far you've gone, my little lace! I am so, so proud of you. When I was your age, I'd only ever gone as far as Lothering. My mother never left Redcliffe. She lived and died there. And now here you are, flying so far with so much purpose. My mind can barely comprehend it, but my heart swells. I shan't take up too much of your time. I know how busy you are. 
I'm looking at the frostbacks on the map as I write this, because I know you will likely be at your skyhold. Please make sure to dress warmly. I have included the recipe for your favorite turnip goat stew. A taste of home to stave off the cold mountain airs. Kisses and hugs from me and your father. Mother. Arboreal Fort A report from Agent Charter, received by the Inquisition's advisors and carrying their notes to each other on the matter. Sheer cliffs and steep drops present obstacles to speedy travel within the basin. As a temporary measure, rope ladders are being constructed and placed at strategic points chosen by Scout Harding. Continued presence in this area will require a permanent solution. Please advise. Charts and topographical information provided for your perusal. Charter. A series of comments follow. Flatten the area? Cullen. Of course the commander suggests hitting the hills until they forget their hills. L. We could look into getting the soldiers to cut steps into the cliffs or construct structures with some form of verticality? Scaffolding, perhaps? Josephine. I was joking. Meanwhile, have you threatened to cut out anyone's tongue today? Cullen. Thinking about it right now. L. The roofer, Baronel, was talking to the foreman about drawing up plans for additions to Skyhold. Covered platforms connected with spiral staircases and suspended catwalks. We could apply this idea to the Frostback Basin. Josephine. I was there. Wasn't Baron all drunk? Cullen. He didn't drop the plans while drunk, I'm sure. We could have an engineer or Dagna look over them to see if they're structurally sound. Josephine. An engineer, yes. Dagna, no. We don't need our outposts to be half in, half out of the fade. Or be able to sing the chant of light, or whatever it is she's working on right now. L. Bloodstained Shrine. We took steps to avoid the Hakonites and stayed out of their way for the most part. It would have gone uneventfully had Price's inexperience not caused him to leave visible prints in the dirt. The jaws of Hakon use them to track us, and even Falker cannot throw them off the trail. Persistent bastards. We ended hiding amidst the moldy corpses and sun-bleached bones that littered the ground around a strange shrine. It was carved of stone and capped with what looked to be a dragon skull. Thankfully, when the Hakonites traced us to the shrine, the sight of it made them stop short. They whispered amongst themselves, and their leader seemed to make a small bow of obeisance to the skull. They then abandoned the chase. We still don't know what it was about that shrine that made the Hakonites balk. Perhaps we don't want to know. From report sent to Scout Harding. Colette's Notes A series of detailed drawings on the inscription, glass shards, and surrounding area follow a handful of neatly written notes. Two stood, felled sixty true before our triumph, a breath in the hunt and let rest the lowlanders worthy of the lady's care. Inscription discovered in Tevinter Ruin within Frostback Basin, not Tevinter in origin. Script style and surrounding symbolism mark text as Avar, writing not widespread in holds. Place marked by a leader or augur, few lowlanders known to be in area at time. Glass in area likely means Templar presence, long past. Samples prepared for Professor Kenrick's opinion. Leather-bound Hakonite Journal Thane Harofsen thinks he alone can work the words of lowlanders, as though the augurs had not learned the tail-drawing runes to study the old magic. He is blind, but the jaws of Hakon would not be here without him. A hold needs blind men with big blades sometimes. In the old times, the first jaws of Hakon spoke with the great spirit himself. He opened their eyes that they might see the elf stones hidden across the world, and they entered the old cave and learned the mysteries of winter. Their working of cold let them slip through the ice wall that wards the lowlander fortress, and we must now do the same if we are to take it as our own. Hakon has been silent all our lives. He cannot speak to us in dreams or open our eyes, and we remain blind to the elf stones. The lowlanders, though, have found a new way to see them. The skull of a dream slain, set with the right magics, can bring the elf stones to our sight. We will regain the mystery of winter. Oh. Mouth of Echoes 
The savages speak to their gods in the cave passage. They call it the Mouth of Echoes. They light fires and feed them with green spruce and shout their questions into the deep. They say answers come to them on the last whispered echo. Superstition, we laughed. And now Razakhal is silent, and madness descends. I can only think, what if? What if there are irregularities in the veil here? What if we could secure the Avar cave and bend it to our purpose? Mm. What if we could secure the Avar cave and bend it to our purposes? The slaves are gathering materials. We will build a shrine to the Dragon of Mystery and plant foci into the walls. Cut sacred designs into the stone, the better to hear her with. We will hear her voice again or we will die. Scribbled in blood-red ink, on parchment found in the mouth of echoes. Nigel's Point I absolutely cannot wait to survey and explore Nigel's Point. This was one of the ruins the explorer Sir Nigel visited on his travels to the Frostbax. So much of what I've learned in this region comes from his notes and sketches. It's appalling to me how little recognition he's received, compared to that brother a TV, or even that peddler of pabulum, Philium, a bard! I wonder if I could discover the original purpose of Nigel's point. Its ancient Tevinter name, of course, has been lost, but I am certain it was built and dedicated to an old god. I wonder which one. If I could learn this... Of course, Harding gives me a severe look every time I suggest I could just stroll over one morning. She insists it's too dangerous. She worries too much. From Colette's Research Journal. Questions of accuracy that moved against them were halted by the light from her most assured hands. It was then she took her own counsel in ways best not set forth here, and led the party away. Did Emeridan's eyes seek hers among those assembled as he relayed the events which led them there? If she stood among us, I did not know her. Yet his hand moved slightly at his side, as my own does when my wife is near and I seek wordless comfort in the touch of her fingers. We had all heard the whispers. Did he say her name in the telling? Would he have dared? Times were different, but have they changed so much? Excerpt from the writings of Lord Biscond, first put to the page in 148 Divine. A letter follows. Kenrick, this is a precise copy. The preceding pages were lost or removed ages ago. Biscond makes no further references to this woman, although Emeridan comes up several times later on. Biscon's writings, as they pertain to Inquisitor Emeridan, are not entirely unknown, although you're unlikely to find them among Chantry records. Their validity is largely dismissed. Some have questioned whether the so-called Light and Council reference magic or holy insight. And, of course, Biscond wrote down his impressions many years after the fact. The author's own wife brought accuracy into question when she admitted her husband was recalling his youth in the Orlesian capital through nostalgia and age-distorted memory. I believe her admission is in part of official Chantry record. Best of luck, M. Places Frostback Basin Halvor often arrives round winter's end, but given the recent weather I hadn't looked for him which is why his voice across the market took me by surprise. Lowlander, I was owed a drink on my next visit, and supper, unless you were getting out of your wager. Maybe I was trying to get out of the bet, but I happily paid the bill at the inn that night. I asked Halvor where he'd last traveled, and he said he'd been trading with an Avar hold in Frostback Basin. Then he raised an eyebrow at the look on my face, so I described the stories Uncle told us as children, where brave expeditions get lost in places like the Western Approach, Nahashan Marshes, Frostback Basin. He laughed and admitted it could be a cruel place. He described thick forests, greater than any I've seen, I'm certain, and darkened swamps. His rule for traveling there seemed to boil down to be wary and alert, because everything can kill you. The wildlife is violent, the cliffs are steep, and you must be mindful of the gods' wishes, here meaning his Avar gods. Of course, the hunting's good, the trade fair, and the Avar hold impressive. 
But do people really disappear in the forest, I asked? Few lowlanders come through. Not sure how many leave after. The last was a joke, but I won't be visiting that hold any time soon. Letter from a Ferelden merchant to his cousin in High Ever. Resources found here. Elfruit, Embryum, Deep Mushroom, Velandaris, Arbor Blessing, Everite, Silverite. Tales A Meriden and the Mage Soft, fade-touched light in dreamlit tones falls dark. Each form a memory recalled through parted lips that try to speak fall silent. Before light marks the dawn, from sleeping fingers she slips into the day where averted eyes bend to any but the other. Oath sworn to lion's call, yet here the two are broken, as waxing sickle stands witness to the end of love's denial and secrets born. From parted lips the words at last are spoken. From A Meriden and the Mage, Author Unknown this overly romantic portrait of illicit meetings between a mage and her lover was written some time in the Divine Age. Though likely penned after Meriden's disappearance, the work was said to be inspired by tales and rumors of the former Inquisitor's Lady Mage. By the Second Age, Chantry scholars had largely concluded that the piece did not refer to Meriden at all, but to another man altogether. These scholars claim that Poem's title was a later edition, meant to discredit the last Inquisitor's reputation. The poem was later deemed problematic and relegated to a list of banned works. From An Examination of Banned Text, Author Undisclosed. Constellation, Fulminos. Commonly known as the Thunderbolt, the constellation Fulminos depicts a bolt of lightning thrown by a wrathful god. Which god has always been a matter of dispute. Each of the old gods of Devinter has been credited as the thrower, with the target being anything from the lost city of Barandur to a jester who made a particularly heinous pun. From A Study of Theodosian Astronomy by Sister Oren Petrarchius. Constellation Visus, known as the watchful eye in common parlance, this constellation had great significance to the ancient Alamari and Syrian peoples of southern Thetis. The story goes that the Lady of the Skies opened one eye so that the light from her gaze could lead her people safely from the frostbacks. When Andraste's armies marched north from their ancestral lands to wage war upon Devinter, they were guided by the eye, and it became the Maker's gaze, not the Lady's, leading them to victory. The sword was added later. It is said that the star that marks the point of its blade only appeared in the night sky after Andraste's death. The early Inquisition took Visus as the symbol of their holy calling when they joined the Andrastean faith, the eye representing both their search for Maleficarum and the Maker's judgment upon their actions. When the Inquisition ended and became the Seekers of Truth and the Templar Order, the Templars took the sword, while the Seekers retained the eye. From A Study of Theodosian Astronomy by Sister Oren Petrarchius. <clears throat> Tale of Hringnar, Ice Troll Tremble at the Ice Troll Hringnar, guard your gaze against his wrath, dead to dreams as dwarves below us, fools and folly block his path. Weapons weeping, Avar warriors struck to seek their legend mark, fed not fortune but the lady, folly fallen in the dark, dead to Hringnar's fury freezing. Came the giants water wading here to hunt and harrow home, Avar fear the shapes and shoreline forced to flee when giants roam. Hringnar ice troll sees his brothers, calls the winter winds to shore, Giants frozen, forged in frostbite, threaten Avar homes no more. Fears of giant battle easing. Came the warriors of Tevinter, armor shining, shields of gold, 
stole the land of Avar keeping, stone carved walls to claim their hold. Hringnar Ice Troll wreaks his raging, lowland warriors weep and shake. Glacier strength did Hringnar conjure, stone to winter walls to break, lowlands flee, their lands releasing. Stay unseen from Ice Troll Hringnar, glacier strength in giant form. None but fools will fight the winter, battle bond the icy storm. Dead to dreams as dwarves below us, wrath of frost and winter's death. Blades are blunted, battle broke, on hide whose chill can frost the breath. Hringnar Ice Troll, winter's seizing. The Hunt of the Fell Wolf the runner strode the winding road, and out of breath came she, upon the bastion of the huntsman true, to make her desperate plea. A meriden and dragon's hide, Haron clad in blessed steel, came forth to hear the tidings brought with so much breathless zeal. Upon the lonely moors, the runner cried, a loathsome beast now dwells. As day gives way to night, it strikes all in its path it fells. Three souls bravely led them out the darkening moor to see, as sun slipped neath the sighing heath, the hunter's guides did flee. The moon crept o'er the heather as a terrible cry released. In silvered light the hunter saw the arrival of the beast. Favored like a wolf it was, in size like woodsman's death. Within its eyes burned eldritch fire, the fade in every breath. Swift as thought the hunter struck, the demon wolf fell back, but mortal strength alone could not prevent the beast's attack. With one huge paw the monstrous thing struck a merit in the brave. Across the moor he flew and fell into a watery grave. Jaws like a dragon's clamped down tight round Heron's armoured chest, and with the night it sped away from moonlight to the west. No living eye was there to see, from peaty swamp arise, a Meriden who found himself alone neath darkened skies. The shattered shield of Haron he found upon the moor, in grief a Meriden did his vengeance swear, the beast's head he would procure. Whilst the wolf across the moor bore Haron to its lair, a labyrinth of winding cave any mortal should beware. By wormlight in the twisting cave, Haron bravely fought to free himself from death's own jaws before his life was not. With blade arm free, the knight struck true into the monster's eye, and off it fled into the dark with otherworldly cry. The wounded knight in darkness found within the cavern's gloom an idol carved of fade touched stone, which could prove the monster's doom. A Meriden all alone did seek the demon wolf's fresh trail, and to the cave he came prepared a wolf's heart to impale. Down the winding cave he sought the beast that slew his friend, and in the eerie worm light met the beast at cavern's end. With burning blade a Meriden and monster met again, whilst elsewhere did Heron valiantly with demon wards contend. As demon stone was shattered, a Meriden struck true. Beast and spirit both felled at once, though neither hunter knew. Now wounded and in darkness, hunters separate made their way, from the bottom of the cavern toward the rising light of day. A Meriden found Heron stumbling wounded from the cave, and both rejoiced to find the other yet free from the grave. As night passed into day, the two did tales of valor spin, and to this very day each claims that he alone did win. The Naming of Stone Bear Hold It starts with a man, Ivar Jerickson. Driven from their hold by war and misfortune, their thane dead, Ivar led what remained of his people through the mountains. The winter was harsh, the winds of Hakon echoed through the peaks, the beasts fled, and the hunters could find little game. Ivar's people grew weak, they feared themselves cursed. When the blizzard struck, they built a meager fire and huddled for warmth. When the blizzard lasted three days, they knew that they would die. 
on the third night, while Ivar stood watch, he caught sight of a great grey bear through the snow. Though the beast was distant, Ivar could feel its eyes upon him and knew he must follow. Alone he made his way through wind and snow. The great bear walked ahead of him, always distant but never out of sight. At last the bear stopped. Ivar came to stand beside the bear and saw before him a sheltered place where his people might be saved. He reached out a hand to his guide, but instead of fur he found grey stone. So Ivar knelt before the stone and gave thanks to Korth, for he knew the mountain father had taken the form of a bear to guide him here. Ivar returned to his people and led them to the sheltered place. Ivar Jerickson became Ivar Snow-favored, and the people swore to honor him as their new thane. The hold was given the name Stone Bear in honor of Ivar's vision, and in this place we have grown strong. From Stories of the Wild South, a collection of tales of the barbarian nations of Ferelden, by Lady Susanna Ashwell of Ansberg. And that, as they say, is that. Um, there was actually a, a bit of a recording snafu in the last bit of this episode, and this is a re-recording of that, so I have no idea what happens after this, <laughs> so... Join me next time when you can find out for yourselves. Until then, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye <laughs>